Sam, how are you doing? I'm Tell good. us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Who do you work for? Right, well, I'm, a, I'm an architect and I'm one of the directors of a company called FAT. Um, we're based in London and we've been working for what seems like a couple of lifetimes now on projects which range from social housing to high-end retail to furniture to master planning. So it's, it's a massive spread of types of projects, types of clients, and I guess types of demands that are put on you as a, as a designer as well. Now you've selected some fascinating images. So we've gone from the technological to the ancient here. So yeah. what's this all about? Yeah, yeah. I, I've been thinking a lot about ancient times, Marcus, and I, I like the, I spent, I spent last weekend, I went to the British Museum to look at the oldest object in the British Museum, which is 1.8 million years old. It's pretty crap, actually. It's a stone that's just had an edge taken off it. And somehow they reckon that it was a tool. But I just wanted to see what this thing was. Like, um, and on the case, there was a really great phrase. It said, it said, could we be human without objects? Like, is the making of objects, the making of tools, something which allows us to create human culture and to essentially separate ourselves from, I guess, what we were previous to that, which is part of nature. And the standing stone, I think, is, an, is a crazy thing, where it's taking something which exists, something you find, and just shifting it 90 degrees so that it suddenly points up at the sky rather than lies on the ground. And that, I think, is, is an incredible expression of, of well, maybe becoming human. Does the object making define human culture? Because I was reading in the summer of that book, The History of the World and 100 Objects, and all of the 100 objects are from the British Museum's yeah. collection. And I think it may even start with that same I think it does. rock yeah. that you're talking about. But you could argue that poetry or music or literature or um, uh, science or philosophy do that job and in fact people from those disciplines there's a kind of disciplinism isn't it if you're if you're into sports you'd say well what defines humanity is our ability to compete and push boundaries is this the design world sort of just feeling a bit smug about itself and saying that no objects? i think it i think it's more it's more to it's more that at that moment there was no difference between science and sport and agriculture and design and slitting the throat of an animal like they were all part of the same way of being I suppose and I think that's I think that's a much more productive way to think about des design is that it's not an activity in and of itself it's just it's something which may involve physics um, um, uh, uh, sociology and politics as well as the arrangement of materials into a shape and you just shown an image of the very beginnings of object culture and this is sort of brings us up to date uh, yeah <laughs> exactly this is the other end of the spectrum the laminated book of dreams as, <laughs> as many call it and I have always loved the Argos catalogue look at it it's an amazing tome and in it you can find absolutely anything you might want if you could swap which I would love to do this one day Marcus to take the contents of the V&A out or the British Museum out and restock it with the contents of Argos and just for a day to think of all of that stuff from Hello Kitty watches to protein shake uh, 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 drinks to garden gnomes, um, disgusting furniture and to think of them as a sort of, I guess, a, a kind of anthropology and that we for a moment could look at ourselves and see what it is that we do, what it is that we make. Um, I think it's really difficult to get a grasp of our contemporary moment. Like it's quite easy if you look back historically and look at a standing stone or you look at you know, the first tool or whatever, or even if you look at you know, 80s design, for example, you, you can suddenly see it with great clarity. It's really hard to see where we are now. And I think the Argos catalog gives us a kind of slice through what we are. Uh, Instagram. I have a, like probably most people have a kind of love-hate relationship with Instagram, but I think it's an amazing, amazingly contemporary object. I think it tells us a lot about where we are and what we want to do with the world. I love it because it combines high technology, it combines uh, you know, network communications, portable devices, 
um, uh, processing power, algorithms, all of that stuff which is like quite hard to understand because it's so ad advanced. But it's allied with this kind of sickly retro nostalgia, like everything's from the 1970s. Everything comes out with this kind of Polaroid glow. Um, colors are bleached out and uh, the sun's always shining. And I think that combination is quite revealing. For me, I think that the idea of a, of a futuristic future uh, must have stopped sometime around 1982 or something like this. I think the future is much more complicated. And I think that digital culture, for example, um, explores this a lot. Like It uses incredibly new forms of media, incredibly new techniques, incredibly new tools. Um, but often it's recycling elements of the past. And Instagram's a great example of this. This is an electronic cigarette. Um, I think these are quite interesting objects because they're a struggle of an old idea through a new form of delivery. And so this is an object which tries to look as much, look and feel as much like a cigarette as possible, but delivers its nicotine through a completely different system. So there's no burning involved. There's a vaporizing kind of barrel that this thing screws into. The length of the cigarette is a battery. You can charge them up with a USB wire from your computer. So it's a really insane object. But it's also, I guess, rem reminds me of objects which exist on the kind of frontier of something new. Um, a really good example is the, is the car. So you know, when, of course, when the car was invented, the idea of the car didn't exist. So it could only be thought of as a carriage without horses. And it was only after a while that the idea of a car as a thing allowed, you know, allowed us to imagine what it, what it actually was. Um, so this, this kind of, I think they call it skeuomorphic design. And it, you find it a lot with digital products as well. Like, um, you know, like uh, the notepad on Apple, where, which has like fake yellow paper and fake margins and fake lines. And, fake handwriting, it, it, it's, kind of, it's kind of the point where you see through Apple's supposed amazing design culture and you see it, actually, it's just a load of stuff thrown together. But that, that, those skeuomorphic moments where yeah. some, a, an old thing made through a completely alternative new yeah. technology, I think are great. This came up with the, in the conversation with Yves Baha this morning, the specific example of Apple being obviously the one that we all engage with all the time, the false leather diary on a computer yeah but it's been suggested that that's a generational thing that steve jobs generation they the sort of even though he was a genius he still to him to be in a diary writing mode meant sitting down at a desk with a leather bound volume on top of it to him reading meant going up to a wooden mm. cabinet and plucking a book from it so he wanted to 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 have that uh, ritual evoked through the computer. Maybe there's a new generation of people who that's, that's meaningless. They don't know what a bookshelf is. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to, I, I actually think I would enjoy um, smoking an electronic cigarette with a digital leather diary. <laughs> I think, yeah, a whole, lo whole load of these skeuomorphic um, things assembled into one relaxing moment. And do you, um, we, we, we've got to try and finish up, but do you have, do you have like a, a take on this? Do you, do, you, do you just find this amusing for its own sake? Or do you think, look, you know what, this is weird or society is going down the wrong track by, instead of thinking what's the best way to get a nicotine hit and there must be another way of doing it through, the, through your, your nose or whatever, a, 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 a USB cigarette? That's kind of weird, isn't it? I guess, I, I guess my, my fascination with, with design is less to do with finding solutions um, and much more to do with design as a cultural activity. I'm fascinated by things like this because I think they tell us about culture. They may be ridiculous, they may often be funny, but I think there's something profound a, a, that they say about the way we, we think and about the, what we want objects to do, our relationship to them, how we understand them, how we, I guess, take ideas and put them into the world, which is essentially is what design does. It takes you know, ideas or ideologies or politics or 
and makes them physical. It makes them into objects and buildings and cities, which then are a reality. So to understand the, the relationship between ideas and things, I think is really important. And to look for moments where you can, I guess a crack opens up in the seamless surface of the, of, of the contemporary and suddenly you go, Jesus, that ridiculously stupid electronic cigarette can allow us to think a little bit about yeah, what objects mean, what we're asking them to do. I think sometimes design is much more a, a cultural activity. Brilliant. That's a perfect note to end on. Sam Jacob, thank you so much for coming along. Ben's going to play us out now with a track by our group of the day, Strong Asian Mothers from East London. Make a sound, I'm guarding. Make a sound, I'm calling slowly. Make a sound, I'm calling.